So let's get into it now. So we, you know, we were talking a little bit about gigantism a moment ago. Robert Wadlow was the tallest man on earth. So this dude was huge, eight foot eleven, really big. Um, I wrongfully thought up until recently that he passed away at a young age because of cardiovascular complications. He actually didn't. He was uh, getting met, he was at a, a, a fair, like a state fair type of thing, um, and they were actually like measuring his height. And uh, because of his giant size, he had to wear leg braces. And leg braces actually caused abrasions on his skin, and he actually wound up getting infection. And in 1940, that's when he died. He died of an infection. Now, if he survived until about 1946, he would have been a perfect candidate to get like penicillin, right? Because that's kind of when uh, antibiotics started becoming like manufactured en masse. But unfortunately for him, he passed away at a very young age. But uh, very uh, interesting case of gigant uh, gigantism. Um, if you go to uh, Odyssey, over here in Scottsdale, the aquarium, there's two statues of him. There's one outside, and then if you go inside to the Ripley's, believe it or not, they have another statue of Robert Wadlow. And I think it's accurate in terms of height. He's massive, really huge dude. But unfortunately for him, that at a very young age. But not due to cardiovascular issues, it was actually due to infection. And as it turns out, bless you, that uh, uh, folks with gigantism are more prone to developing infections. And I don't know why that's the case. Maybe it's just because their body is so big and maybe they're not able to produce as many leukocytes to address infections, but that could be the underlying mechanism behind that. So throughout uh, the next couple lectures on endocrine, these are the different topic topics we're going to be covering. Today we're going to be going through right about here. <laughs> we're not going to cover any of the thyroid issues and Hashimoto's, all that, and then also like Addison's and all that until next time. So today we're going to be focusing on uh, the pituitary gland, prolactinomas, gigantism, acromegaly, and then we're going to talk about diabetes because diabetes in and of itself is a huge topic. Right? Diabetes is very popular. Lots of people have it, especially here in the United States. Folks with a Western diet um, are going to be more prone to developing type 2 diabetes. And we're going to talk about everything that's involved in that treatment, of type 2 diabetes, as well as type 1, and then some of the complications associated with those conditions. So with endocrine disorders as a whole, the two major things that you're going to see is either hypo secretion or hyper secretion. So hypo, great example, of course, would be like thyroid. So if you're hypothyroid, you don't have as much T3, T4 floating around in your body, right? And then hyper secretion, you have too much of the hormone. So Hypersecretion, you could see hyperthyroidism, or in the case of like gigantism, as well as acromegaly, you could see too much growth hormone being produced. So those would be like hypersecretion type conditions. Um, the pituitary gland, where's the pituitary gland? You're going to find it right posterior to the optic chiasm. So one of the things that you might see with a patient who has a pituitary gland tumor is they might start having uh, changes to their vision. Now, what kind of changes are you going to see with a patient's vision with a pituitary tumor? And follow the lines. Not all the lines are going to cross and decusate. Some of them are going to be uh, ipsilateral on the same side. So what kind of vision loss would you start seeing? Yeah, exactly. You're going to have peripheral vision loss. So, you know, you, they might not even notice it. Some people get peripheral vision loss, and maybe they get into more fender benders. Maybe they get into a little bit more car accidents, you know. But you can test it in a clinical setting. You can, you know, test to see if they have peripheral vision. Um, when you're getting your driver's license, what do you do? You, like, when, when you're, you know, before you get your license, they check your vision. You, like, you know, stick your eyes into a little device, and they test to see all of your, you know, uh, uh, areas of vision and see if you have any sort of peripheral vision loss. So with a pituitary tumor, you would see peripheral vision loss. <clears throat> so pituitary adenomas, these are going to be pretty common and they're actually pretty benign. They're not really, not, not that bad. They can be easily treated. So they're going to be mostly benign tumors and one in a thousand people actually get these. So they're really, really, really common. And mostly it's going to be involving some sort of DNA mutation. Now, the symptoms 
And signs and symptoms are going to really depend on what kind of hormone is going to be uh, secreted because of the tumor or what hormones are going to be affected. So if it was like growth hormones being affected, that's what you're going to see. The patient's going to you know, either develop um, acromegaly, if it's um, after puberty or if it's prepubescence, then it's going to be gigantism. Um, you can also see prolactin affecting uh, uh, milk development. So if you had uh, prolactinoma, then you would see galactorrhea. And galactorrhea just uh, is a medical term for um, excessive milk discharge from the nipples. <clears throat> and then, of course, your vision might be affected, right? So your peripheral vision would be affected, so you would get bitemporal hemianopsia. That's the term for peripheral vision loss. Uh, you might also see nausea, vomiting. You might see headaches. And the treatment for this, you can do a hypophysectomy, which they'll just go in there and they'll cut the pituitary gland and, you know, remove the tumor. You could do other types of therapies as well. But if you do a hypophysectomy, that means now you're going to have to go on lifelong hormone replacement therapy, right? So that's, that's one of the major complications of getting those types of procedures done. And we already talked about the optic chiasm and the effects on vision. So let's move on. So prolactinoma. So when you hear that uh, suffix oma, that's going to be a benign type of tuma, tumor. <laughs> tumor. <laughs> I just did an Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, so if you had a prolactinoma, that's the main hormone you're going to be secreting is prolactin. So you're going to get the standard pituitary type tumor uh, signs and symptoms like headache, vision changes. You might get nausea and vomit vomiting. But galactorrhea is going to be one of the major things you see. And um, this affects guys too. And imagine how unnerving it would be for a guy to all of a sudden say, oh, wow, I'm like, you know, uh, I'm lactating, right? Usually guys don't do that. <laughs> so this is especially distressing for a guy. And, uh, you know, not so not as much for a woman, because especially if she just you know, delivered a baby. So it would be kind of undetected uh, if she had just delivered a baby. For, but for a guy, this is like, you know, he'll, he'll go seek medical treatment right away uh, to address that. So um, prolactin, that's going to be associated with uh, uh, produce, uh, producing breast milk. But it can also affect um, the other sex hormones, like follicle-stimulating hormone as well as luteinizing hormone. So if you have a prolactinoma, you could also see effects uh, in other areas as well. So not just nipple discharge, but for women, because if you have a prolactinoma, eventually it's going to stop the release of FS FSH and LH. You might see amenorrhea, right? So that means no menses. Um, you might see hirsutism. What's hirsutism? What does that mean? Yeah, you're growing hair, right? And, you know, for a woman growing facial hair, that's often uh, dealing with some form of hormone imbalance. So you might see hirsutism, like, you know, sideburns, uh, facial hair, all of that. So that would be hirsutism. And for guys, because you're affecting LH and FSH, you're going to be seeing erectile dysfunction as well as potential impotence. So as far as the uh, hormones from the pituitary gland, uh, definitely know your prolactinoma. And now we're going to switch gears into growth hormones. So you guys already covered uh, some of our growth hormone um, uh, diseases. So if you have too much growth hormone, you might get acromegaly or gigantism, depending on if you're prepubescent or postpubescent. Andre the Giant, what did he have? Did he have acromegaly or did he have gigantism? So he had acromegaly. So in other words, he started um, experiencing excess growth hormone after puberty. So after the closing of the epiphyseal plates, then you're going to see growth hormone affecting different parts of the body. So he had just a massive, you know, massive jawline. So he had uh, changes in his uh, facial features over time because of excessive amounts of growth hormone. So somatotropin. Uh, versus somatostatin. Somatotropin is going to be the other term for growth hormone. And um, if you have too much growth hormone, that's when you start getting a lot of uh, growth in your skeletal muscles as well as your bones. Other things that can happen, you might also get uh, a lot of buildup of, of, of proteins and amino acids. 
And then you can also see a lot of fats getting broken down because fats, when they get broken down by growth hormone, it allows for the uh, creation of energy. So what do you see with growth hormone? You're going to see your adipocytes being affected. So when you break down triglycerides, you get excessive amounts of fatty acids. At your muscle tissue, um, you're going to see decreased glucose uptake. So you see increased glucose production. Um, with amino acid and protein synthesis, you're going to see uh, in, uh, decrease in amino acids being readily available. And then with the liver, you're going to see a lot of gluconeogenesis. So you're going to see increased amounts of glucose. Um, so when you have excessive amounts of growth hormone, you might also see hyperglycemia in those patients. So that would be one of the uh, more concerning consequences of too much growth hormone. Now, what if you took growth hormone exogenously? What's going to happen to your growth hormone levels? Of course, they're going to go up. What's going to happen to your growth hormone releasing hormone levels? It's going to go down. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. So the HPO access is going to try to compensate for that. So if you have too much growth hormone, then you're going to see at the hypothalamus, you're going to see a uh, reduction in your growth hormone releasing hormone levels. So make sure you're, uh, you know the difference between your gigantism and acromegaly. The main difference is going to be puberty. Right? So if it's prepubescent, you're dealing with gigantism. If it's post-pubescent, you're dealing with acromegaly. And if you have hyposecretion, that's where you get uh, dwarfism. And more specifically, it's going to be your proportional type dwarfism. So this is a really famous uh, photograph of a young lady. I don't know her name, but a pretty famous case of uh, you know, photographs tracking her throughout her development from you know, adolescence, childhood, into young adulthood, and then as she got older, you could see those pretty significant changes to her facial features. So she's a good example of acromegaly. <clears throat> so with growth hormone, you're getting stimulation of your long bones, right? So if you get this before puberty, that's when you develop gigantism because your bones are going to be growing uh, very rapidly. So Robert Wadlow is going to be one of the most famous cases of this because he was the tallest man on earth at eight foot eleven. Today, uh, the we the the tallest man on earth now is this guy, Sultan Kosin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he's a lot shorter than Robert Wadlow. He's eight foot one. Robert Wadlow is eight foot eleven. He almost has an entire foot on him, which is pretty impressive. But notice, a lot of these guys are wearing, you know, leg braces. He has to, you know, walk around with a cane. Because when you have this massive stature, you're going to have a really hard time maintaining your posture and being able to uh, you know, ambulate and move around properly. Hmm. Let's watch a little video of this. This, this video is awesome. Why is that working? Hold on a second. Let me get the volume cracking up here. Someone turn all the volume down on me. Ha! Huh. Incidentally, him and I wore the same exact type of shoe. So Stacy Adams, Madison boots. But he had to have his custom made because he's so big. <laughs> That's absolutely massive. Such a cool video. So here's another case of gigantism. This young guy, 12 years old, six foot five, just absolutely massive, just towering over his mom at 12 years old. All right, so those are all examples of gigantism. 
Now let's switch gears and talk about acromegaly. So of course, this is after uh, puberty. So, <clears throat> and it's going to be happening in adults, of course, post puberty. So you have a lot of tissue growth. You're going to get bone enlargement. You're going to see this mostly in the face. You're going to see this in the face, the hands. You're going to see protrusion of the mandible. Um, you also might see hypersecretion of, of sebum at the sebaceous glands, as well as sweat. Um, hyperglycemia. That's one of the major concerns with this, right? So with hyperglycemia, you're going to see insulin uh, intolerance. Over time, you're going to start developing diabetes as a consequence. And so the three Ps, which we're going to be talking about later, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. So those are your three Ps of uh, hyperglycemia. And the person doesn't really notice it throughout their life until like later on when they really start, you know, developing those massive, you know, those changes in their facial features. It's very gradual. It's very gradual, but it can also lead to some serious illnesses as well as premature death, right? So it's going to affect different parts of their body, right? Hyperglycemia, of course, being one of them. So you're going to have like cardiovascular type of consequences from acromegaly as well. So here are some other examples of acromegaly. So you got Andre the Giant, this really cool actor that uh, played in James Bond. He had the metal, I forget what his character's name was, but he had like the metal teeth. So lots of famous people with these different conditions, right? Sometimes they can get pretty successful, uh, successful uh, careers in like entertainment and stuff. Andre the Giant especially was a really interesting dude. I'll play a little bit of this video. Stories about Andre's drinking are almost a, another level of mythology from the man himself. Andre was certainly one of, if not the greatest drinker that ever lived. I myself saw him almost every night drink 7,000 calories worth of alcohol. Take 20 to 25 beers, maybe four bottles of wine, usually several mixed drinks. Whether I was the only one that had to drink a day. Andre was a big drinker after his life. Well, especially with Andre Lawrence. Andre, at minimum, was a drinker. All right, so you guys get it. The guy was a raging alcoholic. <laughs> Just massive, dude. Look at that, 500 pounds. That is absolutely insane. <laughs> and there's a penchant for alcohol like none other. Really impressive. So that's his name, Richard Dawson Keel. So that's Richard Dawson Keel. He was also in Billy, that's Billy Madison, I think. Happy Gilmore, sorry. Yeah, uh, you know, Adam Sandler. <laughs> um, and this was him and James Bond. And then Andre the Giant. Look at him coming face to face with Hulk Hogan. So this massive dude. Now, let's talk about dwarfism. Now, this video is really cool. So this is the tallest guy currently. That's Sultan, I forget his last name. But he's the one that clocked in at uh, eight foot one, I believe. And this over here is the shortest man in the world. And he's from Nepal. So let's watch a little video on him. The Guinness World Record is tight and the world's shortest. Uh, the most visual and the most iconic of all the records that we've ever seen. Uh, everyone's fascinated around the world by the character. Thank <laughs> you. 
This part's really cool. Love it. So don't pick them up. <laughs> Whatever you do. All right, so dwarfism. Uh, achondroplasia, of course, doesn't fall under endocrinology. Right? But you'd be remiss to talk about dwarfism without addressing it because it's one of the types of dwarfism. So don't confuse that. It, this is a genetic condition. It's not dealing with hormones. So it's going to be involving uh, the FGF3 uh, gene. We'll talk about that in a second. So yeah, this is uh, Peter Dinklage, that's how you pronounce his name, the one from Game of Thrones, among other films as well. So that would be a, con he would be a case of achondroplasia. Okay, so that's not the same thing as uh, a growth hormone deficit. So this is a good chart that, or image, a graphic that shows you the difference between those two categories of dwarfism. You got proportionate dwarfism versus disproportionate dwarfism. Achondroplasia falls under the latter. Right? Whereas with proportionate dwarfism, that's going to be where your head and your torso, all that in terms of its ratios and its proportions are all about proportionate size. Right? And proportionate dwarfism, you'd be thinking 
you know, certain genetic conditions like primordial dwarfism, but also uh, deficit of growth, growth hormone. Uh, versus achondroplasia, this is the gene right here. It's your fibroblast growth factor gene. Okay, so if you have a deficit of fibroblast growth factor, FGF3, that's going to be affecting your ability to grow your bones. All right, any questions on growth hormone? No? Cool. All right, so let's switch gears. Let's talk about the pancreas and insulin and all of that. Why do I have Patrick Swayze here? Why do I have Luciana Pavarotti? They're some of the two most famous people that died from pancreatic cancer, which is a really horrible, aggressive form of cancer. Now, whenever I talk about pancreatic cancer, I like to always ask, where in the pancreas would be worse to get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? Would it be at the head or the tail of the pancreas? So what does the, where's the head of the pancreas? It like, it's where you see the attachment to the duodenum, right? So the head of the pancreas is where you have a uh, connection to the duodenum. The tail of the pancreas is not connected to the duodenum, right? So where would it be worse to get cancer of the pancreas? The head? No. So the tail, but not because of that. The tail because that's a silent killer. By the time you become symptomatic, it's already too late. It's been advanced stage pancreatic cancer, and it possibly metastasized already. The head of the pancreas is actually better to get cancer in, if you were to get, choose one or the other, because you're going to be symptomatic earlier on, right? Because that's where you have the ampulla vater. That's where you have this, you know, sphincter of OD. You would start seeing, like, the buildup of bile. You would start getting all the symptoms of pancreatic cancer, right, earlier on. And then that means you can get treated quicker and faster and more effectively if you get early treatment. Tail of the pancreas, that's really bad because once you're symptomatic, it's kind of too late. So really uh, difficult condition to have. So this is where the pancreas is going to be. So here's your head. That's, uh, you're going to see the pancreatic duct as well as the bile duct converging, and it's going to be released out of the ampulla vater as well as the sphincter of odium. And the pancreas is going to be involved in a couple different functions. So you have both the exocrine as well as the endocrine function of the pancreas. So with exocrine function, uh, exocrine glands versus endocrine glands. So with endocrine glands, you're going to be secreting things into the bloodstream, right? So it's going to go into the blood and it's going to go off and target things far away in the body. Exocrine glands are going to be a little bit more uh, localized and the ducts are going, there's going to be a duct involved sometimes. Not always, but sometimes you're going to see ducts with exocrine glands. Um, target organ, of course, with endocrine gland far away. Target organ and targets are going to be closer for exocrine function. Um, so what does the pancreas do? The pancreas releases a bunch of different important substances. So you have, in terms of endocrine, you're going to see glucagon, insulin, Okay, those are going to be some of the major ones. And then for your exocrine function, you're going to have your digestive enzymes. So what would those be? You guys know, do you remember from back in the day when you took AMP, the digestive enzymes? Protease, amylase, lipase. All right, those are the three major ones. What does amylase do? Break down what? Carbohydrates, starches, yeah. So, and what does protease do? Proteins, lipase, lipids, right? So that's pretty easy. Amylase, of course, is also produced in your saliva from your parotid glands. So when you're chewing a cracker or a piece of bread, after like a little while, those complex carbohydrates are getting broken down into disaccharides. Once they're disaccharides, then it's, you perceive that as being a sweet flavor, right? Because you're breaking down the carbohydrate into disaccharides. So the pancreas does all that. So there's different cells in the pancreas. There's going to be alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Um, the alpha cells are what produce glucagon. Beta cells are what produce insulin and amylin. We'll talk about amylin a little bit later. Not exactly a key player, but it's uh, important nonetheless. And then delta cells produce your somatostatin. So somatostatin would basically stop growth hormone from doing its thing. So the islets of Langerhans, that's where you find these really important 
endocrine type cells. That's where you're going to find the cells that produce insulin, aka beta cells, as well as the cells that produce glucagon or alpha cells. Insulin is going to be released after you have a lot of sugar floating around in your blood, right? So insulin helps to bring sugar into the cells. Right? It's going to help to bring glucose into the cells. What about glucagon? What, what, when does glucagon get released? Yeah, when glucose is gone, right? So it's kind of in the name, sort of. So when glucose is gone and you need to produce more glucose, glucagon gets released. It can help to break down things like glycogen. So you can have like, you know, glycogenolysis as well as gluconeogenesis to produce more glucose. So that's what happens with glucagon. They're going to be operating in opposition to each other. They're antagonists, right? So they have opposite effects from one another. And here's another image that depicts all that. So you have your islets of Langerhans. That's going to be your endocrine cells. Your exocrine cells are going to be outside of the islets of Langerhans. These are the ones that are going to produce like your amylase, lipase, protease, and all of that. Hmm. Oops, sorry. And then your alpha cells versus beta cells. Alpha cells, glucagon, beta cells, insulin, and glucagon is what helps to increase glucose synthesis, gluconeogenesis, things like that. So you increase your glucose levels. Beta cells, amylin and insulin. What does amylin do? So amylin is going to stimulate satiety. What does satiety mean? You're, you're not hungry anymore, right? Satiety means you've been satiated. You're full. You don't need to eat anymore. Uh, it's also going to inhibit glucagon because if you have glucagon getting stimulated, you're, now you're going to start increasing more glucose in the blood. Think about it. Like you just ate a big, maybe carbohydrate-heavy meal. Now you're going to start seeing a, a glucose spike. After you're done eating a meal, you should feel satiety, and you also don't want to release more glucose because you're already going to get glucose getting absorbed into the body. right? So that's what amylin does. So if you're in a fed state, what's your glucose levels? Up or down? Up. Fasting state? Down. Good. What about glucagon? Fed state, is glucagon going to be up or down? Down, right? Because they operate in opposites to uh, insulin. Um, what about fasting state? Up. Excellent. What about insulin? It's going to go up in a fed state. Fasting state? Down. Good. Now, what about amylin? Yeah, good. So amylin is going to follow insulin, right? So when insulin goes up, amylin is also going to go up. And it's going to go down in a fasting state. All right. Let's move on. Now, this was something that you guys already saw earlier in the semester when we were talking about acid-base imbalance, when we were talking about ketoacidosis. I know some of you all got confused by this chart. But this chart shows when you have different processes coming into place, whether you have readily available glucose from eating a meal just recently versus when you're in a fasting state and now you need to produce more glucose because your brain, of course, needs to consume a lot of glucose to be able to function properly. And so if you have enough glucose, then you're going to start seeing more glycogenesis, which is the production of glycogen and you're going to see glycolysis as a consequence. So that's what happens when you are in a fed state. So you don't need to produce more glucose, right? You already have enough glucose. So you can store it in the form of glycogen, or you could use it in glycolysis for metabolism. Versus if you're in a fasting state, it's going to be the opposite. If, you, if you're fasting and you're becoming hypoglycemic, then you're going to see gluconeogenesis to produce more glucose. You're also going to see glycogenolysis. And when you break down glycogen, you're freeing glucose, right? Because glycogen is a highly branched storage molecule, right, for energy reserves. Where do you find glycogen? Liver and, did you point at him? Oh, you, I actually pointed at him because he's got lots of muscle. <laughs> yeah, so skeletal muscles. So he's got a lot of glycogen. <laughs> all right, so that's what's going on with glucose, gluconeogenesis, and all those processes involved. So when you uh, have a lot of glucose, then you're going to release insulin, right? And insulin is going to help to lower glucose released by your beta cells, right? So it's going to help increase the amount of uh, glucose uptake at the cellular level. 
and it's going to also stimulate glycogen to be formed, right? Because you're trying to get rid of the glucose in the blood. You're also going to see a lot of ATP formation. Um, you're also going to see uh, triglyceride formation at the level of the adipose tissue because uh, the glycogen storages are full, and then you're going to start seeing fat production as a consequence. If you have too much glycogen, you don't need any more glycogen, so that's going to get stored somehow. It's going to get stored in the form of triglycerides. So with insulin, you're going to see reduction in glucose. You're going to see reduced protein breakdown, reduced fat breakdown. So if the insulin levels are low, you're going to see the opposite. You're going to see elevated glucose levels, right? So you're going to become hyperglycemic. And then if you're hyperglycemic, you're going to have thirst centers getting stimulated. That's why you get the polydipsia of hyperglycemia. You have polydipsia, polyphagia, okay, polyuria uh, as well. So you're going to see polydipsia, which means you're thirsty, right, because of hyperglycemia. You're also going to see polyuria because you're going to get osmotic diuresis. You're going to see decreased, uh, increased protein breakdown, um, and you're going to see weight loss as a consequence. Increased fat breakdown is also going to cause weight loss. The fat breakdown can also affect the liver, so you might see sciatic hepatitis. And then fat breakdown, you see elevation in ketones. That's why you get DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, as a consequence. And then with reduction in fat and carbohydrate, you're going to get polyphagia. So you're going to feel really hungry. So you're going to want to eat more. This one right here, the weight loss. What's going on with weight loss? Type 1 diabetics especially are going to be very thin. Right? Type 2 diabetics tend to be a little bit heavier set right? because it's going to be evolved with like metabolic syndrome and weight gain, and insulin insensitivity. Whereas type 1 diabetics are going to be usually thin, and they're born with it, right? It's an autoimmune disorder that destroys those beta islet cells, so you're not producing insulin. What do young gals like to be? They like to be thin, right? For the most part. I'm sure not everyone, but uh, oftentimes if a young gal is type 1 diabetic, sometimes she might actually not take her insulin so that she can continue to lose weight and stay thin. So that's actually a very unfortunate theme with some type 1 diabetics, and they'll throw themselves into DKA, and then they'll become hospitalized as a consequence. So there's better ways of losing weight, right? So uh, instead of not taking your insulin when you probably should be. But that's the underlying mechanism of the weight loss. You're, uh, if your cells are starving because you're not bringing in glucose into the cells, you're going to see energy coming from other places, right? It's going to be coming from protein as well as fat breakdown. So that's why those individuals tend to be a little bit skinnier. So this is how glucose works. Uh, it's going to bring sugar, sorry, insulin is going to work by bringing glucose into the cell. Um, you're going to get reduced protein and reduced fat breakdown because now your cells are getting enough energy just from the glucose. Another thing that's going to happen too, if you look at, so you have insulin binding uh, to the receptor here. Part of the process is going to involve the sodium potassium pump and you're going to see potassium coming into the cell. So if a person has DKA and you treat them with insulin, you should also give them potassium too because otherwise they're going to become hypokalemic if they're undergoing DKA, right, because of this whole process. So you don't want them to be hypokalemic because we talked about cardiovascular and all that. It's going to cause arrhythmias. It can also cause in, um, issues with uh, their your central nervous system. What's up? Yeah, give them potassium. You can give them banana bag. Yeah, because you're going to want to give them IV fluids if they're in DK, and you're going to want to try to, like, you're also going to want to try to stabilize their pH as well. So I wouldn't recommend, like, lactate ringers because that would sort of bring their pH down. You want to do something that would increase their pH a little bit. Yeah, you'd probably give them bicarb. Yeah, absolutely. But the potassium, you definitely want to give them potassium. You do not want to make them hypokalemic. And if you give them a lot of insulin, that could potentially kill the person, right? If they become too hypokalemic. So, what's going on with uh, these different cells? So you have your alpha cells that produce glucagon. Um, if insulin and amylin are released, that's going to prevent alpha cells from releasing glucagon. However, if you wipe out your 
beta islet cells, those are not going to be producing either amylin nor insulin, right? And that means that glucagon is going to be un, it's not going to be hindered at all. It's going to be, it's going to look like hypersecretion of glucagon. So with type 1 diabetes, you get the destruction of the beta islet cells, and you're going to become extremely hyperglycemic, right? You're going to get lots of glucose production, especially when you have the breakdown of glucagon, or sorry, the breakdown of glycogen. Um, you can also see destruction of your beta islet cells over time with type 2 diabetes too. Type 2 diabetes is insulin insensitivity. So the cells are not really sensitive to insulin because they're constantly being flooded by glucose. And so they don't really get as sen uh, sensitive anymore to insulin because they kind of, uh, they downregulate those receptors, right? But further than that, like further, uh, further in time, like over time, you're also going to see exhaustion of the beta islet cells. So over time, the beta islet cells stop working because they're constantly producing insulin. And over time, they, they just get worn out and they burn out. <clears throat> so here's a brief thing on glucagon. So glucagon is going to be released by your alpha cells. And it helps to stimulate the breakdown of glycogen, right? So you can release glucose as a consequence. It also stimulates the breakdown of triglycerides. And it can also uh, stimulate production of glucose from the liver, right? So you have gluconeogenesis as well as glycogen, uh, glycogen, li uh, the lysis of glycogen. So breaking down of glycogen to release glucose. All right, now let's get into diabetes and the different things that you would see with diabetes. Uh, diabetes is really bad. Um, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, osteomyelitis, retinopathy, renal failure, cardiovascular disease, stroke. There's a lot of things that diabetes can cause, right? Diabetes is really, really bad. Um, diabetic foot ulcers like this, that's going to be associated with a couple things. It's going to be associated with peripheral neuropathy because you don't feel the cut in the foot, right? You don't feel the cut. You're walking around. It gets infected. And then all of a sudden, if it gets down into the bone, that's osteomyelitis. And one of the major ways you treat that is by amputating. Right? Did I tell you my friend, my, well, not a friend, but he was kind of like a colleague of mine who's a podiatry guy, and he jokingly says part of his job is to make people shorter. I think I already told you guys that, right? Yeah, so that's, that's why he makes people shorter. He's like dealing with a lot of diabetic patients, unfortunately. Here's a photograph that I took. That was a photo, one of my patients. This guy had uh, a diabetic foot ulcer, and this thing was one of the most foul-smelling things I've ever smelled. Um, it was due to Proteus mirabilis, which is a gram-negative organism that you find in your GI tract. You also see that causing UTIs, too. But for this guy, it got into his foot, and it caused a diabetic foot ulcer. We sent him to get, like, x-rays and stuff just to make sure that it didn't get to the bone. Thankfully for him, it didn't get to the bone. So he didn't get osteomyelitis, but he already had amputations before. Notice, he doesn't have a big toe, right? So he's had previous amputations. So you, diabetics will often get several amputations over the course of their disease, especially if they're not um, keeping their glycemic control under wraps, right? So treatments, you want to do glycemic control, pharmacotherapy, improve vascularization, because that's the other thing that happens too. You lose the sensation due to peripheral neuropathy, but on top of that, you're also getting microvascular damage. So you get peripheral vascular disease, and so you don't get good blood supply. So not only are you getting infection, you're not able to treat the infection with your leukocytes, right? So your white blood cells can't fight off the infection properly. And then you're also not going to get proper tissue repair because of the lack of blood supply, right? So it's like a, lots of things coming into uh, contribute to the severity of these types of lesions, right? It's pretty, pretty nasty. Huh. Maggot therapy. Have you guys ever seen that before? If you go on medical talks, like I told you to do on Instagram, there's a couple, there's a couple of posts that they put that showed maggot therapy. You can actually use therapeutic maggots. And what the maggots do, they consume all the dead necrotic tissue. And they actually leave the good tissue uh, untouched. So they're actually very helpful. They look horrendous, but they're actually very beneficial for treating these types of wounds. 
So this is an overview of all the things that diabetes can do, right? So it can destroy your eyes, causing retinopathy. It can destroy your kidneys, causing nephropathy. Lots of your dialysis patients are going to be diabetics or hypertensives, right? Um, you're going to see neuropathy, especially peripheral neuropathy. You're going to see effects on your brain, right, like cardiovascular disease. Uh, you're also going to see strokes, right? Um, heart disease, coronary artery disease, and you're going to see poor wound healing, peripheral vascular disease. Basically, the entire body gets affected by diabetes. It's terrible, right? Uh, my colleague, Dr. Jackson, refers to, like, all the sugar in your veins floating around in your blood. He likens it to little shards of broken glass, right? And as the little shards of broken glass float around your body, they damage everything that they come in contact with. So hyperglycemia is really, really, really bad. So what are normal glucose levels? Normal is anywhere between 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. If you're hypoglycemic, that means you're below 60. That's not good. You do not want to be hypoglycemic. You're going to get altered mental status. You're also going to look pale, so you're going to be pallor, fatigued. You're going to have diaphoresis, sweats, tremors, shakes. As we go over there, it's shakiness, uh, altered mental status, confusion, things like that, versus hyperglycemia. This is where you get those three Ps, and that's above 300 milligrams per deciliter. So polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and then weight loss, especially with type 1 diabetics. So those are all the things that you see with altered levels of blood glucose. So type 1 diabetes... This is the one that's considered juvenile onset, right? Younger people are the ones that get this. You're kind of born with it, and it's an autoimmune disease. We also refer to this as insulin-dependent diabetes, and that's because the pancreas isn't able to produce its own insulin. Therefore, the person now is dependent on insulin exogenously, right? So they have to take insulin to be able to treat this. And there's different types of insulin. There's like short-acting insulin for when you just eat a meal right then and there. There's long-acting insulin that can help maintain your blood sugar throughout the course of the day. There's intermediate insulin. Um, there's a lot of different types. And type 1 diabetes sucks because you have to constantly be thinking about controlling your blood glucose. I had a friend when I was in high school who she would always have to like inject herself with insulin, so she's always thinking about having to maintain her blood glucose. So it's a pain in the ass to have type 1 diabetes. It's not easy to control. It's a very, very, uh, very unfortunate condition. And then type 2 diabetes, that's where you get it as an adult, right? And this is non-insulin dependent. And what, what happens is you become insensitive to all the glucose. Sorry, you become insensitive to insulin. There's so much blood sugar that the, the cells, that the pancreas can, continually has to release insulin to try to control the blood sugar. But then the cells are like, yeah, there's so much insulin. Let's start like downregulating the receptors. So they downregulate the re receptors. It becomes insulin insensitive. And then over time, late stage, you get that islet cell burnout. Those islet cells stop producing insulin at some point. They get tired. Um, and then you have to also then take insulin as well, uh, exogenously. But there's other drugs you can take. At the onset, you can take metformin. There's some other drugs that I'll talk to you about in a second. But you're not responsible for the drugs. But metformin is one of the gold standard treatments for type 2 diabetes at the onset. Later on, over time, they're going to have to take insulin. So what was your question? At the at the at the later stages, at the later stages when you have the beta cell destruction, you would start seeing that. Especially, you would start starve. You would starve the cell a little bit at the onset, so you could see like triglyceride breakdown, protein breakdown. But most type two diabetics are going to be a little bit heavier set, and then I'm by the time you get the late stage type two, then you would probably start seeing some weight loss. But usually at the onset, it's usually like heavier set individuals. So that's a really good question.
Oh, really? Yeah. So a diet to help prevent autoimmune disorder? Like the right reduce like inflammation? Right. Diet is sticky because there's so much information out there that's sometimes not even like good, solid information. So yeah, managing diet is gonna be really important for both of these, right? It's really big for type two, but also we're like type one too, the you know, it's a you have to manage your diet and you have to manage the meds. You have to know when to inject yourself with the insulin and at what times of the day. It's, it's, it's tough. It's very tough to manage. If it's insulin resistance, I, it, at that point, it's really not, you can't reverse it. Because you, you have islet cell burnout. The cells are basically just worn out, exhausted, no longer functioning properly. So at that point, it's irreversible. Um, earlier stages is reversible. There's lots of diabetics that type two diabetics who have had like they were able to through diet, exercise, things like that, they're able to go back to normal. So that does happen. All right. So type one diabetes, autoimmune. Okay. So I really want you to be familiar with that. So it's an autoimmune dis disorder that destroys those beta islet cells. Okay. Um, so this is what's going on. Uh, you're destroying those beta islet cells. You're not going to have enough insulin produced. You're not going to have amylin produced. And remember what amylin does, amylin is going to help to especially block glucagon. Right? So if you don't block glucagon, now you're going to produce even more glucose. Right? So now you're going to break down glycogen and you're going to get gluconeogenesis. So your blood glucose goes really, really high if you're not able to inhibit uh, glucagon from the alpha islet cells. Um, usually individuals in their early teens are going to be diagnosed with this. Sometimes they get diagnosed with it when they go into DKA, when they wind up in the hospital. It's a diabetic ketoacidosis. And then the signs and symptoms are usually going to happen once you have about 90% destruction of those beta islet cells. It's a genetic thing. So family history, genetics. Also, the reason why I highlighted this in red Autoimmune disorders beget autoimmune disorders. So if you have one autoimmune disorder, it's very likely that you might develop more autoimmune disorders. So people with celiac disease, um, people with type 1 diabetes, uh, people with lupus, SLE, any of those conditions can coincide with other autoimmune diseases. So they kind of, you know, they kind of come in pairs, in threes, Right, so it's it's a really unfortunate situation. Um, signs and symptoms, of course, hyperglycemia, and then you can also get hypoglycemia too uh, if you're producing if you're uh, using too much exogenous insulin. So those are not good situations to be in. Type two diabetes. So switching gears. Now this is uh, the insulin uh, independent type of diabetes, right? So your beta islet cells are still producing insulin, right? At least at first. So the thing is, your insulin receptors are becoming more and more insensitive. Because there's so much insulin, the receptors are going to get down-regulated, and so you're not going to uh, be sensitive to insulin, and so your blood sugar goes up as a consequence. And then eventually you get that beta islet cell burnout. Let's watch a little video here. Type 2 diabetes is a condition in which your blood sugar level is too high. Carbohydrates are substances your body uses to make energy. After you eat food that contains carbohydrates, it eventually goes to your small intestine. In your small intestine, the food is broken down into single sugar molecules called glucose. The cells in your small intestine soak up the sugars, which pass into your bloodstream. When the blood reaches your pancreas, it detects the high amount of sugar in your blood. Normally, this causes your pancreas to put a chemical called insulin into your bloodstream. The insulin reduces the amount of sugar in your blood to a healthy level. How does insulin do this? As the blood moves through your body, 
the insulin and sugar exit the bloodstream into your tissues, reach your cells. Most cells have structures on their surfaces called insulin receptors. When insulin flows by, it attaches to the receptors. The insulin acts like a key in a lock to open up the cell. So the sugar can get inside. Now your cell can use the sugar to make the energy it needs to work properly. And your blood sugar level drops back to its normal range. If you have type 2 diabetes, your cells don't respond to insulin as they should. This is called insulin resistance. When this happens, your insulin cannot unlock the cells to let sugar in because the locks, or insulin receptors, are missing or aren't working. As a result, sugar is locked out of your cells. When sugar can't get into your cells, it builds up in your bloodstream. This is a condition called hyperglycemia. In response to the high blood sugar levels, your pancreas makes more and more insulin. The overworked cells in your pancreas try to keep up but they slowly lose their ability to make enough insulin. These problems may lead to the symptoms of type 2 diabetes. If you have questions about type 2 diabetes or any medication you have been prescribed, speak with your doctor. It is important to take your medications as directed by your doctor. Tell him or her about any side effects you have. This animation. Brought to you by the Nucleus Medical Art Library. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so that's type 2 diabetes in a nutshell. Uh, as I mentioned, diabetes is extremely common. That's a lot of people who have diabetes. It's almost 10% of the entire population in the United States. Like I said, very popular. <laughs> right, so lots of people have it. Um, of those people, the majority of them are going to be obese. Right? So obesity is one of the major risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Other risk factors, genetics, family history, those are going to be things that contribute to diabetes. Um, obesity, of course. Uh, very common in indigenous populations, unfortunately. So my colleague that I was telling you about who makes people shorter, he works on, in the Navajo Reservation. And diabetes is extremely rampant in indigenous populations. Uh, so Native Americans, Native Alaskans, uh, also African American populations are going to have a higher percentage of diabetes type 2. Um, PCOS is polycystic over ovarian. What's up? Oh, gosh. Uh, a lot of it's dietary. Right? It's, a lot of it's dietary. Um, yeah, no, it's not necessarily that. So there's a lot of genetics that go into it. Uh, a lot of it's genetics, yeah, because, you know, before, like, the Western diet, right, people were like hunter-gatherers, right? Hunter-gatherers are very healthy. Um, the moment, uh, and uh, another thing about hunter-gatherers is that um, they'll sometimes have a higher rate of, like, fat accumulation, right, because they use that in times of, like, you know, when there's not enough food available. And so uh, folks that come from those types of, like, you know, genetic lineages of, like, hunter-gatherer tribes and things like that, um, as soon as they get introduced to, like, a Western diet, then they're going to have more, like, adipose accumulation, things like that. Yeah, so those all are going to contribute to it. So a lot of it has to do with genetics. Um, you know, African-Americans, especially, that come from parts of Africa with lots of hunter-gatherers, right? So that's where you see a higher risk of developing those types of conditions. What's up? Socioeconomic status can definitely contribute to it because if you're in this, if you're in like quote unquote food deserts, right, you're not getting access to good nutrients, right? Sometimes you'll go to like fast food restaurants instead. To, you know, that's where your most of your food comes from. Um, so yeah. Definitely. So lower socioeconomic status definitely will contribute to poor diet. That is absolutely true. Yep. Any other questions on all that? 
So, signs, okay, yeah, PCOS. Uh, for whatever reason, PCOS predisposes women to developing type 2 diabetes. So that's kind of an interesting side effect of that. Hyperglycemia, you get those three Ps, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. And skin changes. So acanthosis nigricans is a skin change that you're going to see in obese patients with type 2 diabetes. And so you're going to see these kind of like velvety dark patches on skin folds. So you can like see it on the back of the neck. You could see it on the, ar on the axilla, right underneath the armpit. Um, and so that's usually going to be one of the signs that the person might have hyperglycemia, right, or insulin resistance. So that's going to be one of the things you can look for on those patients. Um, obesity, in general, is going to increase inflammation. Um, obesity is, you know, it's something that's affecting a lot of us here in the West, right? Sedentary lifestyle, Western diet. Um, obesity not only predisposes individuals to like hypertension and diabetes and all that, also very uh, tightly linked to cancers too. There's a lot of cancers that are going to be linked to obesity. So it's, it's pretty, it can be pretty brutal. So you got chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation can cause all sorts of damage in the body. You have increased triglycerides, increased cholesterol, increased fatty acids. Leptin and ghrelin. What does ghrelin do? Where's ghrelin from? Huh? Your stomach. Yes, good. I like to think of ghrelin as when your stomach goes grr because it's hungry, right? So if you have a lot of ghrelin being released, then it's going to signal that you're hungry, right? Versus leptin is going to be a satiety type of uh, molecule. Now, if you get insulin resistance, of course, you get hyperglycemia, early stage insulin resistance. You get uh, lots of insulin being produced, but the cells aren't responding to it because they're down-regulating the receptors. And then over time, you get the beta receptor, sorry, beta cell uh, burnout, beta islet cell burnout. And then you get reduction in both insulin and amylin production. That is going to result in reduced satiety right? Because your cells are like starving, right? So if your cells are starving, you're going to perceive that as being hungry, right? So you're going to have polyphagia as a consequence. Um, and then you're going to get, uh, with a lack of amylin and, um, and insulin, you're going to get your glucagon effect. So with glucagon, you're going to see increased gluconeogenesis and increased glycogenolysis, right? So that's where you get like a lot of your hyperglycemia is going to come from those different processes as well. So here's another uh, breakdown of everything that's going on with um, hyper, uh, that leads to hyperglycemia. I'm not going to go through every single step of the way here on that chart, but that's just there for your personal reference. All right, so with uh, hyperglycemia, with type 1 by diabetics, we already talked about this when we went into acid-base imbalances, but Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the major effects of type 1 diabetes. And your glucose is going to be off the charts above 250. You're going to have ketones, so you can test that on the patient. And it's acidosis, so they're going to have a low pH and they're going to have low bicarb. And this kind of goes to what you were saying about these patients. You could give them bicarb, right, to be able to offset that. Um, type 2 diabetics, um, they're, they're, you can see hyperosmolar hyperglycemia, and that's a non-ketotic type syndrome. Your glucose is going to be really high, but you're not going to have those ketones. What's going to happen with your uh, capillary beds? So these are all the things that can get affected. So with your capillary beds, you're going to get microvascular damage. Right? That's going to result in hypoxia to those tissues that are affected. You get ischemia. You're not going to get proper blood flow. You're also not going to get leukocytes to those areas, so you're going to have higher risks of infections. The diabetic retinopathy is going to be one of the major causes of blindness. It's one of the most common causes of blindness worldwide. Okay? Um, kidneys. It's also one of the major causes of diabetic nephropathy and end-stage renal disease. Uh, peripheral neuropathy is going to be one of the major causes of that. 
Um, motor neuropathy, of course, if you start getting your motor neurons getting affected. And you can also see your autonomic uh, nervous system getting affected too. So you can see like incontinence, you can see impotence in those patients as, as well as gastroparesis. So here's your diabetic foot ulcers again. So atherosclerosis, you get cardiovascular disease, um, hypertension, CAD, CHF, all that stuff. Cerebral vascular disease, you get strokes, and then peripheral vascular disease. That's where you get those ulcers that are really, really hard to heal. Right? You're not getting a proper blood flow to those tissues that are affected. And then you get a really high risk of infection, which is a high risk for osteomyelitis, which is a very high risk of amputation. Um, and here's the reasons why you get those uh, effects for infection, right? Reduced sensation, hypoxia, pathogens are going to also appreciate all that free-floating sugar just kind of floating around. Um, and then you don't get as, not, as much leukocytes to those tissues. So you're not able to fight the infection off. What's your question? Yeah, type, type 1, it's not going to happen in type 2. You're not going to get ketoacidosis. Watch a video. The video is pretty gruesome. This patient suffered from peripheral vascular disease in this situation with a complication of the as well as. Look at that metatarsal completely darkened from necrosis. All right, so making people shorter, <laughs> not fun. It's very sad, it's very sad. It's not a good situation. I've had lots of people in, in my family, friends that have had to do that, who have had parts of their bodies amputated because of diabetes, so it's not good. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Smoking causes hypertension, causes arthrosclerosis. Oh, yeah. The more stuff you pile on to that, that contribute to cardiovascular disease, the worse off you're going to be over time. Right? It's like you have added risk factors, comorbidities, right? Those are all things that contribute to poor peripheral vasculature. Uh, yes and no. Nicotine can cause hypertension, but it's usually transiently. Right, yeah, that's true. I'm actually not really sure what the mechanism is. <laughs> I should know the mechanism of that, but nicotine can cause transient hypertension. I don't think that's necessary. I guess just being constantly exposed to nicotine, right, would over time cause more issues with the cardiovascular system. But, yeah, that was a really good question. I'll have to look into that in more detail. How do you test for diabetes? You're, you can do a couple different types of tests. You can do fasting glucose. If your fasting glucose is above 126, that's when you can diagnose a person, person with diabetes. You can also, oh yeah, by the way, if their fasting gluco, glucose is between 100 to 125, they're in pre-diabetic territory. You want to tell that person, hey, listen, like you're, about, you're going to be developing diabetes at some point. Um, maybe lifestyle modification, change their diet. Okay, so that's pre-diabetic. But once you're 100 above 126, that's in the diabetic realm. And if you get a uh, random glucose at any point that's above 300, that person's also you can diagnose that person with diabetes. The other thing you can do too is the fat um, is the hemoglobin A1C. So what does a hemoglobin A1C do? Uh, it's going to allow you to track glycemic control over the course of about three months or 120 days. Why is that? How long does a red blood cell last? About 120 days, right? 
So about three to four months, you can actually track the person's glycemic control by doing a hemoglobin A1C. And with the hemoglobin A1C, uh, it's going to be glycosylated hemoglobin. It's, it's stuck to the hemoglobin. So as long as the red blood cell is alive, you can see how much sugar that the person's been consuming in their diet. Um, this is good for long-term tracking for, for a couple reasons. One, uh, you can track to see whether or not the meds that they're taking are effective, right? So they might have to switch the meds up, maybe have to up the, up the dosage, things like that. You can also see if they're compliant with the meds or if they're compliant with their diet, right? If they're like non-compliant, this value might be elevated. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people are like, oh, I've got a doctor's appointment in the next couple of days. I better, you know, I better behave. I better maybe like put down the cupcakes and like, you know, <laughs> try to maintain like a good glycemic control. And then they go to the doctor, they do a fasting glucose. It's awesome, right? The values look great. And then they check the hemoglobin A1C and it's like, uh, not so great. That means that the, for the past three months, the person has not been either taking their meds or maybe they're just, you know, not doing the right thing, right, to help control their glycemic index. Um, so that's why the hemoglobin A1C is a really awesome test to test for long-term glycemic control. And so here are the different values. I'm not going to test you on the different values, but if it's less than 5.7, it's normal. Pre-diabetic is going to be between 5.7 and 6.4. And then for diabetes, it's 6.5 and above. <clears throat> oh, did I say 300? 200 milligrams per deciliter if it's random blood glucose. So if it's above 200 on a random uh, glucose uh, check, then that, that's going to be diabetes. These are the different drugs you can use to treat diabetes. Metformin is going to be one of the most common ones on the list. So metformin is really good uh, as a drug. It's pretty well tolerated. As a matter of fact, it's been found to increase all core. Uh, it's, been it's been shown to reduce all-cause mortality. So it's actually a pretty decent drug. Um, so it's really good for all sorts of different reasons, not just for uh, glycemic control. Other drugs that you can use are sulfonylureas. Um, those are pretty good. You can take drugs like glitazone. Uh, you can use these drugs in combination, depending on how old you are, whether or not you're obese, whether or not you come from an Asian background. Um, the cutoffs for obesity are a little bit different for Asian populations. It's actually reduced, the cutoffs. So they have a lower threshold to be considered obese and to actually have any sort of like uh, you know, negative consequences due to their weight for whatever reason. I think it's a genetic thing. All right, moving on from diabetes, the common types, type 1, type 2. Let's touch on briefly gestational diabetes because this does happen. It's actually relatively common. Gestational diabetes it involves a patient, or a mom, rather, who has never had diabetes before. And while she's pregnant, has started exhibiting uh, signs of uh, insulin intolerance. And so this is pretty common. It affects a lot of pregnant moms. So 2 to 10% of pregnant women are going to have this. And what's going on? It has to do with the hormones from the placenta. And that is going to sometimes interfere with mom's insulin. So <clears throat> with this, you can treat it Right? You can try to do uh, diet and exercise as lifestyle modifications. You could also, if it's bad enough, start giving the mom insulin as well. So that's one way you could do it. One of the big concerns, though, is that these moms are going to have a way higher chance of developing diabetes even after they're pregnant, right? after they deliver the child. So that's one of the big concerns with that. Now, if the child uh, is going to be exposed to elevated glucose levels, then the child could also develop uh, macrosomia. Macrosomia is just a fancy term for a big baby. Right? And so uh, children that are born with macrosomia are also going to have some complications as well. So first of all, they could die, right? So they could like, you know, they could just die in the womb, so that could be a stillbirth. But when they grow up as adults, those children are gonna be at a much higher risk of developing type two diabetes as well. So it's a Serious risk factor. Um, for mom, big concerns would be hypertension, preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is really, really bad. That's where like the mom's 
blood pressure is like off the charts. I had a, I had a student of mine who was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant. She developed preg uh, preeclampsia in her pregnancy. She actually lost her child. It was really, really sad. Her blood pressure was so insanely high, like I couldn't believe it. It was like medical emergency levels of, like in, I told her, I was like, you need to go to the hospital. Her blood, her systolic was up like almost 200, which is really, really high. Um, so that can cause stroke in the mom. That can cause all sorts of issue. And of course, it can also cause spontaneous miscarriage, and which is what happened with her, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and then after baby's delivered, you have a higher risk of developing diabetes later on. So where are we at with time? We are at 2.30. I highly recommend watching this video. This dude is so funny. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I'm not going to play it in class, but <laughs> definitely recommend it. This is actually a longer version of this video. This is like the highlights and the clips. The way he pronounces diabetes is so, so funny. Anyways. <laughs> The diabetes guy.